Well, good afternoon, everyone that's here and watching online. I'd like to welcome you to come, and uh, we're going to start some worship today. Alana's going to come sing some worship songs, and then from there we're going to do the uh, communion and then uh, offering and then start the message. So go ahead and welcome uh, Alana to come up and sing some songs of worship. So go ahead and join with us um, as we prepare. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, if you'll just bow your heads with me and pray before we start. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives today. We are so thankful, Lord God, that you have given us the ability to praise you and to worship you in the midst of every situation. And we come before you today and we just worship you in all that you're doing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. My Jesus. My Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength let every breath all that i am never cease to worship you shout to the lord all the earth let us sing power and majesty praise to the Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I'll sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise. The wonders of your mighty love, my comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I'll sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Jesus, nothing compares to the promise we have in you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the precious blood of Jesus. Nothing but your blood, Lord. We thank you for your blood. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. There is nothing worth more that could ever come close, no thing can compare, you're our living hope, your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you send your spirit. We thank you that you're in this place. We thank you, Lord, that the atmosphere changes when you come. Lord, come and be with us today in a greater measure, in a new way, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Let's uh, go ahead and be seated, and we're going to um, be uh, passing out the communion. Um, <clears throat> as we... Uh, Pass out the community, just be waiting on the Lord. Um.
Well, I look forward to communion. I look forward to uh, service and seeing everyone today. Um, thanks, uh, welcome for coming, or welcome to come, and uh, good to see you again. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I love about communion when we take it together is there's a picture in the book of Acts where it said they were breaking bread with one another from house to house. And um, it, I really believe as we, you know, take communion and we, we break bread, you know, with one another, it's just returning back to that, you know, the standard of the church that we see in Acts. And so, um, and also just to be able to share such a sacred thing with uh, one another in Christ. And so um, we're going to go ahead and start. Let me get mine. There we go. All right, I'm in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse uh, 23. It says, uh, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. So we just take the bread. And when you have given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, Father, we just take this bread. Lord, the, the, the precious body of Jesus, remember, Lord God, that so many things that you were broken for us, that by your stripes we were healed. We thank you for your body. In Jesus' name, we just break it and take it. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So, Father, we just thank you for the precious blood of Jesus, that we just take this cup in remembrance of you. Remember what Jesus did. And we just proclaim his death till he comes in Jesus' name. Now we're going to go ahead and take the offering. And uh, when I was asking the Lord about what to share again, you know, it always goes back to the matter of the heart. And just we want to honor the Lord from a heart so that um, we don't do things out of obligation, but we do things out of love for God. And so we're just going to go ahead and uh, pass if you need an envelope. Just uh, raise your hand. We can get one to you. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just pray. Um, over the offering as we begin to, to take it up and um, and just uh, as we bring in to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So, Father, we, we come before you, Lord, to bring to you, Lord God, um, Lord, our, our, love, our love to honor you and your word through tithes and offerings. And we just thank you, Father, for blessing us. I just ask you, Father, that as we have given and we have obeyed your word, God, that you multiply it, you... Uh, Bless it, God, exceedingly, abundantly above all we can ask or ever think, Father, and that you begin to, Lord God, do your part as we have obeyed. And Lord God, that you provide all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So I thank you, Father, for honoring your word as we, Lord God, come and do it as you have commanded us. And we just thank you so much for this opportunity, God, to come in alignment with you, to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So go ahead and... And as I pass that around, um, last time, I'm going to do some recapping today. Uh, we had talked about, um, as we're preparing for this outpouring, one of the things the Lord has instructed us to do is, you know, to start to get the structure, the structure of what he wants to do here in the leadership and, and also um, in this preparation for the outpouring that's coming in, in July. And one of the... Uh, the first things he started out with uh, is finding the hope of our calling. We talked about that um, last time. And so I'm going to just go over a few uh, scriptures that we shared, or that was shared, um, because we need to keep a vision of what God's doing. We need to keep it because, and the scripture says, you know, where there there is no vision, the people perish. And so I want to make sure that we keep the vision strong and that, we keep the revelation of God strong in our hearts so that as we're going through, we know that there's persecution that comes and tribulation and different things, um, but that we keep this vision strong in our hearts and that we keep it before our eyes in, in the sense of that we're, we're meditating on, we're looking at what God is going to do and what God is doing in our life. And the other one is uh, in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Um, 
we need to know what God is doing and we need to know what our part is so that we don't ha- we're not destroyed we don't have uh, what I, what I say open doors to the enemy or we don't have these things where we don't know what we're supposed to do so we just kind of go and <laughs> kind of like a track you know we just get on this routine and we just keep going and going uh, as I had grown grown in my walk with the Lord I, I remember so many times getting in this routine of not growing just kind of doing a lot of work. You know, you ever see those little those little mice and they're in that little circle and they're just going, 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 going. And they're just doing this exercise, but they're not going anywhere. They're not doing much. And sometimes we have a lot of works and not a lot of fruit and uh, because we don't know what God's called us to do. And sometimes um, we never ask that question or given this opportunity um, of, what, of saying, let's find out what God has for you so you can fit in this body that God is is growing and bringing up in the body of Christ. And so I want to turn back to um, some some scriptures that we were talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Um, I like going over scriptures over and over again to get it in me. I feel like repetition is good. Uh, we're supposed to meditate on the word night and day, and that's kind of why we, we go over and do these recaps. But... Um, Verse 11, it says that, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the tricky of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Um, I want to highlight this last part, uh, for the edifying of itself in love. And a lot of the sermons, uh, one of them I was talking about, uh, one of the keys to to prayer, uh, powerful, effective praying is love, the love of God. Um, And it's different than the love of men because there's an aspect of it flows from God to us. Sometimes uh, I like to use this example because we live in in an English world and this is uh, communicated in the Greek. So when it's translated, sometimes we can, you know, lose things in translation. Um, But you know, I've heard, we've all heard like, oh, I love pizza or I love that dress. I love that car. And then all of a sudden you hear, oh, I love you. <laughs> and uh, as, um, you know, you hear that sometimes you're like, so what, what measure of love is that? Like, a, do you love me like a pizza? You know, <laughs> love me like a car or, you know, what, what is that kind of love? And um, so as we had gotten in, this, getting the scriptures, we find that the Lord gives a definition of what love is that he wants us to portray. Um, he wants us to grow in. He wants us to share with one another. And that's the agape love of God. It's, uh, you know, as I read through it, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We're usually all pretty familiar with this passage. But I find it important that we go back to some of the basic things um, because sometimes as we progress and we see signs and wonders and miracles, as we test the apostles or false apostles and we find that they're false, as we read in Revelation when he's talking to the church in Ephesus, um, they lost something. They lost their first love in the midst of all this. And I want to make sure that we continually go over the aspects of what love is and how we're supposed to love one another in the body of Christ and love God so that when we get to the place where we're seeing signs and wonders, we, we don't lose perspective. Not get off on the tangents of watching the manifestation of Christ come and then we miss Christ. You find in First John, it says that if you don't love your brother, how can you love God? Because your brother, you can see him, but God, you cannot see. And so the Lord has taken me through a journey about really finding out how to love one another and walk in the love of God with one another, and it costs. It's not cheap. When you find the love of God, it's something that breaks yokes 
and destroys burdens. I'm going to share some stories from my personal life um, about this love. But what's, uh, let me go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians because as I was talking, I forgot to turn. <laughs> um, thank you for being patient with me. I'm, I'm pretty green sometimes. Uh, so as I've been learning to walk in being a pastor and preaching so much more than I usually have in my life, um, a, lot, a lot of times when I'm getting prepared, when I was getting prepared to come here, I spent a lot of time meditating God's Word and preparing, um, spending time with God, um, not necessarily communic- communicating so much out of all my experience. We had some Bible studies in Houston, which if you're watching online in Houston, um, I haven't forgotten about you. We're, we're going to put all this stuff together. We're just trying to get all the timing. Um, but I would share the things that God would give me um, on a one-to-one kind of level. I, I actually love to do that because I find it powerful. You know, some of us uh, have been given this ability to be one-on-one with people, and it's kind of like that skill where it's close quarters combat in one way, um, but it, you're powerful in it. You can sit there and tell someone about the love of God, and you're powerful in it. And I, um, and so that's something the Lord had grown me in, and now he's grown me in another aspect of being powerful and communicating to more than just one person or a group of people, you know, or a large group of people. But either way, I, I love to share what God is doing and what God's done in my life and so that other people can grow and experience the same things that I have. Um, when I came into this ministry, one of the things that drew me was I heard about Pastor Johan's experience in heaven. And I thought, wow, I would like to have that same experience. And so I got a hold of his materials and I began to go through a lot of things and um, the Lord began to show me that I needed to get some um, more teaching and foundation on the Word before I could even be prepared to have that encounter. Not that God can't do that, but for my personal walk with the Lord, I went through so much of the Word to prepare me for my time with Christ, to encounter the things of heaven. Um, but in the same way, when I had not had that experience, I desired it so much that I told the Lord, Lord, if I could ever help someone else have the same experiences that I've had with you to encounter you, that you're just not someone who's in this book in the sense we read about you, but you're living, you're, you're, you're doing works among us, you're speaking today, you're alive, and you still do the same things that you do in the Bible. If, if I could help someone else, I will. And I told him I would, I would help someone. And so I always like to keep the promises that I give to God. So in any way I can help you experience God in any kind of way and, and, and growing in love, growing the fruits, growing in, in, and seeing him and, and experiencing the peace of God, that's something that I want to do. So that I kind of share from that perspective that I want you to be able to encounter the same Lord, the same God that we serve, not just know about him, but to know him. And so I'm going to read about this love of God because that is one of the things that when I first encountered God, he began to teach me of his love. For so long, I had been in a dry and thirsty land. <laughs> we live in a culture where we talk about love a lot. It's there in some aspects, but it's not the God kind of love. And people are searching. I was searching. I want the love of God. I want to experience this love. So it began to take me through the scriptures on it. So I want to read again uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Because he had me get in it so many times. Because if there's anyone who lacked love in their life, that was me. I was jaded, a lot of times bitter and judgmental. And I, my, my uh, kind of philosophy in life a lot of times, if it gets hard, well, I'll just cut my losses and move on. Um, but when I met Jesus, he was not that way. He didn't see people as losses. He saw them as treasures. And so everyone here, I just want to let you know you're a treasure. And when you begin to see what God sees in other people, you begin to say, oh, Lord, what's helped them become what you you see? And that's what's powerful about the love of God is it helps you to see something that you couldn't see before. You know, when we talk about Paul, who was named Saul, He was a murderer. He killed many Christians, threw him in prison. 
but he was doing it because he thought that's what God wanted him to do. And so when he got converted, he was having a hard time having fellowship with the brethren because everyone was afraid of him. Better watch out for that guy. You don't know if he's going to come in and we're going to get killed, <laughs> thrown in prison. And so uh, there was this interesting man named Barnabas, which many of us are familiar with him. If it wasn't for Barnabas, I don't think we would have been able to get the revelation from Paul. Now, I believe that the Lord ordained Barnabas to bring him in. But Barnabas had to see something. And what I believe he saw was the love of God in Paul. Because when you see the love of God in somebody, it, there's, a, there's a difference. It brings a light. It brings um, a glory that you don't necessarily see when someone who doesn't love God. See, we're more than just what we say. We, we are the things that God has made us. And so if you have little love in God, even though you might have great sermons or, you know, might know all these wise things, there's still an element to where you're not able to communicate the love of God very well. Not very powerful. So as I read this, um, I want to begin to get this in us. It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And that's where I was talking about people who can speak different things and tell you all about God, but they have no love. It's kind of like, you know, those big old, you know, monkey, you know, and I've, I've been in the place where someone's talking to me, not out of love of God, but out of a religious obligation. And it's kind of like a turn off. Ugh. And I don't want us to be that way. And I know that we we're all at different places and, um, but what I want us to do is grow in this love so that we don't come across in this way. And though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. See, he's given this picture here, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I give my body to be burned. You can actually sacrifice yourself from other people. But you have not love. It profits you nothing. I don't want us to have a life where we have no profit, no reward. So in order to do that, we have to have this love in order for it to profit us. You know, if you give someone a glass of water, but you do it out of the love for God and love for them, it will profit you many times about giving water and how there's a reward for that you know if you the lord talks about you know you you came you give me water you visited me in prison i was naked you clothed me and uh he gives this admonishment to those who are like lord I, I didn't i didn't i didn't do that for you i didn't give you water i didn't feed you and he's like yeah but when you did it to one of these little ones you did it as to me so one of the tests of love and one of the examples that God gives of love is an expression to man. Because we love God, we show others his love. But it's not an easy thing to do. When you don't have the love of God in your heart in the sense that there is a lack, there's a brokenness. It's very hard to go through what I'm about to talk about here. Um, I understand how hard it is because I've been in that place. But I want to share the key on how to get healing in your heart so that you can express the love of God. Verse 4, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believe all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, 
but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am, I am also as I'm known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. Uh, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Um, I want to focus this, this scripture in tw uh, verse 12. It says, for now we see dimly as in a mirror, or in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. See, there's an aspect as we grow in the love of God. At first, we begin to see the things of God dimly. It says as in the mirror, it's, there's this reflection of God that we're able to see, but it's dim. We only have a, a little bit of it. But as we grow in the love of God, things begin to be sharpened in us. Our vision begins to be what I call, it, there's a growth process of it. A baby starts out and they can barely see the shapes of their parents. They hear them. They feel them. But over time, as their eye begins to grow and mature, they're able to tell, oh, there's the face. There's, there's my mother. There's my father. And they know. We start out a lot of times in our growth process by learning to hear God, learning to feel him. Lord, something's off here. That, that's not you. And we do that through the word. But when we come to see God face to face and we grow in sight, you can't do it without love. So encountering God, there has to be a basis of the love of God that flows in your life. Little love, little sight. Now sometimes we see that there's giftings that the Lord gives and people are able to see and they're not walking in the love of God. And we'll talk about that. I want to, I want to just, uh, that the, there's exceptions in the sense that the Lord does give gifts to people. And when he gives gifts, he doesn't take it back just because we're not walking in the, the way we're supposed to. So if he gives you the ability to see things in the spirit or to have the discerning of spirits, which we're going to get into later, um, you, can, you can still have little love and see some things. But when it comes to seeing in a mature level God in a greater way, it requires love at a greater measure. Sometimes people can see things only at a certain measure. They're at what I call a certain frequency of sight. Um, you know, we can't see uh, certain frequencies of light. But if you have certain filters, you can see certain things. But if you don't have um, that thing in you, you're not able to see. So when we want to encounter God at a deeper level, it always starts out with love. And when it comes to the things of God, if we don't have love as a basis, we're building an empty structure. You ever been somewhere where the love of God is not? Big, massive churches, and yet you go in and where is the love of God? When I read about the love of God, and I was, there's an action to it. There's a process of flow. It's just not something that's like, oh, I love you, but I know you might be hungry, and I won't feed you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you might be in prison. Well, you brought that on yourself. Why am I going to come visit you? But that's not the, how the Lord's model is. He says, no, when you visit those in prison, why? Because, yeah, some people made bad choices. We all have. But the Lord doesn't want to leave us there. So when I was talking about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, there's more to it than just knowing what you're supposed to do. It's equipping you with the love of God so you can do it. Love suffers long and is kind. Does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love suffering long. <laughs> I use the model of a mother because, you know, I had shared before about the Syrophoenician woman who came to get deliverance for her daughter. She first, when she met Jesus, he didn't even talk to her. Now we know the Lord is perfect. Now I've heard a lot of different things about why he didn't talk to her. Maybe she wasn't ready. Maybe she had to press in a little bit more. I can't exactly say 100% why that is but there is something about great faith that comes out of great love 
then we see the, the, the mother comes again, tells all the disciples. And they come and say, hey, Lord, you got to deal with this lady. She keeps on bothering us. And I find that as another um, interesting quote that I even myself have been in. Man, these people are bothering me. Lord, do something, please, to get them to quit. <laughs> um, I don't believe that's what God is share, uh, wanting us to, to be either. I believe the Lord wants us to come to him, not so people will leave us alone, but because our great compassion for them, to see them set free. And Jesus, you know, tells the lady that healing is the children's bread. You know, I'm not sent to you yet. And we know that when Jesus died and was raised, that this great love and covenant of healing came to the Gentiles. Thank God. We have it. We're engrafted in. But what she did was she kept a, hum a humble position. She says, you know, even the dogs, because he called her a dog, and... Uh, but any preacher called anyone a dog would not be the last, usually, of that preacher. <laughs> but uh, Jesus called it like it was. She recognized where she was, but she said, even the little dogs, they, they eat the crumbs of the, at the master's table. So Jesus said, because of this saying, you know, your daughter will be healed. Great is your faith. And, and, and she was healed from that very hour. The reason why I bring up this story is this woman, this mother, went through great suffering so really think about it you get rejected first how many of us really quit if we go to somewhere to get prayed for and someone's like i'm not praying for you like well, i'm done with you you know there's no pressing in but see she knew something she knew that jesus was the only way to get her healing for her daughter and sometimes we've come to god and we haven't heard anything no answer I thought, oh, well, maybe maybe it's not God's will. And then there's other times we come to the men and women of God. And they're like, Lord, do something for them so they'll leave me alone. <laughs> and yet we don't experience the thing we're asking God for. And then uh, there comes a time when we come before the Lord. And, and I believe this is, I'm going to use a different example because we're living in a different time. But the Lord says, I want to deal with the things in your life before we deal with this other thing. See, that woman was the mother, a Syrophoenician woman was the mother of this daughter. If she kept living the way she was living, and what he was saying, being like a dog, was living outside of the covenant of God, living outside of doing the things of God, or not doing the things of God. If you keep living like this, even if I heal your daughter, more things are going to come. And as we have learned in the Bible, it talks about when one demon's cast out, it goes and it looks for another place, and then it comes back to check to see if they can get back in. And it brings seven worse than itself. I believe Jesus knew this principle. And he said, okay, I need her to recognize that she needs to change her life. So when he said this thing, she humbled herself before God. And I believe she got this picture about Jesus. That he really did want to help her. Even though he said, you know, the children's bread, well, that's not for you. You know, I'm not sent to you. But there was something in her that believe that Jesus was good. Something that maybe I can get an overflow. So when she said, you know, even the, the dogs, the little dogs eat, eat from the master's table, the crumbs, the little things, she, was, she just needed something. The Lord's like, ah, she's where I can help her. She's humble before me. And he was able to bring healing to her daughter. That, that lady's life was transformed. Her home was different. Now we see this love and this, this, this love that had a corresponding great faith. 
we're having an outpouring that's coming. And there's going to be a lot of people who are in situations that might not be uh, what we would call um, right with God. They might be in that class where the Lord is speaking about, you know, the, you're Syrophoenician, you're like, you're a dog, you know? And I don't believe he was saying that she's an actual dog. Well, I mean, her lifestyle is living wildly. That was what I believe he's trying to communicate. There was not God focused. And so we're going to be dealing with a lot of people who are coming who need the love of God. We need to be able to give them that love. And in that process of showing the love of God, we need to know what that love is ourselves. A lot of times we can't show something we don't have. And there's going to be many tests and different things that happen that take us back to a place of seeking the love of God for ourselves so that we can give it out. Um, we had talked about growing thereby in the good word, you know, like babies, newborn babies, they grow on the milk. We were supposed to grow on the milk of the word. And um, there's going to be a lot of babies that come. They're going to cry, have dirty diapers, you know. Um, and we're going to have to be patient and kind. You know, sometimes even though people are adults, they're not mature. Just because you're 65 years old doesn't mean you're mature. And there's a, there's a standard of maturity that the Lord gives in the Bible. But you can have someone come in who's a baby, and they're acting like a baby. And what Paul says here, uh, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There's times when we're going to encounter people who do childish things. They speak childish ways. They understand as a child. And they think like one too. And we have to be able to help them in that time by suffering long with them. Now, in my own life, I have not been very long-suffering, but the Lord's taken me through a lot of things to help be long-suffering. When you start to grow in the things of God, it says, no servant is greater than his master, and everyone, and every servant that's perfectly trained will be like his master. So I look at these things and how Jesus went through a lot of persecution. Even his own disciples at times didn't believe in him. And yet he was patient with them. He was long-suffering with them. He believed the best. And I, I love, um, it says, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bear all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. See, that love that never fails, it can break people that never encounter God. It can even break people who have been hurt with God. Now, uh, I'm going to share this story from my marriage um, because uh, one of the things God's used to help perfect your love is a marriage. Um, I heard this statement before. I believe it's true that marriage isn't to make you happy. It's to make you holy. And we find that when Jesus gives an example in Ephesians about marriage, he talks about you know, using the, the, the marriage, the marriage uh, model that we see. And um, we see that the, Jesus does a lot of different things with the church, washes them with the water, the word. But when uh, you're in a marriage, there's a lot of opportunities to grow. And so one day me and my wife had a, you know, one of those spats that was, you know, over a course of time. And so um, I was not being very kind or loving, or like Jesus. I was still in a place in my own life where I was broken, but I was angry. And, uh, you know, whether or not someone does something to you, um, you still have a, the ability in the test of how you respond. So sometimes somebody might do something minor, <laughs> Like, oh, he took my car, so I'm going to punch you in the face or something. You know, sometimes we return and respond back in a greater multitude of what I call an evil response. So I was in that category. Lord, forgive me, even to this day. Um, I was in that category. I wasn't being very nice, very short, you know, sending messages that weren't very sweet, 
wasn't the dating relationship that it started out with, you know, with, oh, I love you, LOL, or, you know, whatever. It was not there. So I'm sure, I'm sure in every relationship, everyone's experienced this fight, you know. But it only takes one person for God to move in the matter. It just takes one. And so at this point in time, it was very late. I think it was at least 10 or 11. And uh, I hadn't eaten most of the day. I don't even think I ate all that day. And my wife asked me after I'd been pretty hard and cold, mean, snippy, irritated, <laughs> so many words. My wife asked me, are you hungry? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm hungry. And then I was thinking, what, you're going to make me food? You know. And so she goes, well, do you want me to make you something to eat? And I thought, no, don't worry about it. I'm fine. She goes, no, what do you want? Let me make you some chicken soup because I really like chicken soup, by the way. And, um, and I was like, yeah, sure, fine. So she started making chicken soup from scratch. It takes some time to do that. Not just one of the cans you open up and here you go. You know, She took her time. She's praying, preparing that. And she was doing it not just to me. She was doing it to Jesus. And I remember talking a little bit later, and correct me if I'm wrong later, <laughs> Where she was saying, Lord, you know, I don't know what to do here, but you're going to have to deal with them. And so she began to make this chicken soup, cut the celery, cut the chicken, cut the onions, prepare prepare all these different things just the way I like it. Add the butter in there. I like the butter in there. Um, and then she gave me this soup. And she sat down. Is there anything else you might need? Are you thirsty? And I sat there, and God's love began to break me. Now, I want to take a stop right now because sometimes we respond in the same measure that we were treated. But the Lord says, you know, we don't, we don't conquer through the ways of the world. We conquer basically through the ways of God. And um, so she began to dote on me. Now... I'm a pretty logical person, and I'm I'm pretty uh, when it, when it comes down to it, I can be legalistic in some senses, you know. When I sat there and I thought, huh, I wasn't expecting this response. I was mad. I was upset with her. But yet there was a line that the Lord showed me at, that even though she might had made a little mistake, the way I was treating her was greatly displeasing to the Lord and, and pretty bad. And so I began to look at it and I was like, you know, I treated her horribly all day and I began to becoming truthful with God. And yet she gave me something I didn't deserve. It's not easy to make soup when you're tired or to dote on someone they've been horrible to you. But she did it anyways. And how did she do it? Well, she said, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do, but I love you. And I'm trying to honor him, like it says in their word, respect him. And so as I'm eating this soup, I break. And even now, I look back at this great love that God began to show me through just the simple making of soup when I didn't deserve it. Because I look at my life, and I was like, God, I knew I didn't deserve that. There's times when people are pretty horrible to us. And even my own life, I responded wrongly, but I want to bring up this point in verse 8 of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, that love never fails. We learn that God is love and God is holy. But what is it about this love that never fails? You can't debate this love. 
you can't manipulate this kind of love and you can't imitate this kind of love. It's unique to the message of Jesus Christ. It's unique to the church. This love will break down walls. This love will bring men and women to their knees. I have been a hard man in my life. I had at one point in time decided to make all emotion that I had go away. It's too painful. I was going to be a soldier. I was going to be a machine. I was going to be strong. No one was going to hurt me anymore. But what I was trying to do was to stop the pain. A lot of times we're just trying to stop the pain. And so on my journey of finding Jesus and the love of Jesus, the Lord used my wife. I like to honor my wife. She's been such a strength to me. And in my walk with God, the Lord used her to show me a picture to experience the love of God when I didn't deserve it. Now, there's so many times we don't deserve the love of God. It's not about our merit. Yet, why we were yet sinners, he, he loved us. And so, in meeting the lost, we're going to need to love them while they're yet sinners. They're going to respond like sinners. But we don't condemn them we give a plea to them. See, we are all sinners at one point in time. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But yet the Lord Jesus came to us anyways. As we were rebels and, I mean, so many times I look at my life and I'm like, God, thank you so much for forgiving my loveless, heartless evil and so in finding the hope of our calling I believe one of the biggest things we have to find is the love of God for us personally the second thing that we need to do is learn how to express it even though we will have to suffer sometimes my wife suffered was long suffering with me. I mean, it was all day I was giving it to her. I'll just be honest. All day. Why did you do this? Blah, 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 blah. I don't believe you or whatever. But when she asked Jesus to help her, I believe she didn't know. I believe I really didn't know. That at that moment, in that point in time, we got a revelation. That love never fails. I go back to that model and that example. Because we have been in such a time and an hour where the love of men has grown cold. We see cold people doing evil things to one another. That in a rational mind, a mind where... Um, there's some element of love, they wouldn't do such things. But it says in, in this time that the love of men would grow cold. But I remember another scripture where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. I believe when the love of men grows cold, the love of God grows hotter. We had talked about the seven times glory that's coming and that is with us and it's being expressed in different measures as it's poured out. I believe that's a seven times love of God, the glory of God that comes and begins to bring a fire, begins to turn up the heat and melt the cold love of men's hearts. The Lord's been having me in First John
So as we begin to find the hope of our calling, the first point I want to give tonight, I'm going to go over some points, but is we must find the love of God for ourselves before we can find the hope of our calling. Um, the second one is in order to build a structure where we're joining and knit together. We talked about this body coming together and building a structure. We need to have the love for one another because that's what's joining us together. When it talks about that joint together with one another, it talks about the love of God. Um, and this, or the model that I see is, is the love of the Lord. Because how can you be joined together if you hate one another? See, you can have a big church, lots of people come together, and there be no unity. You can have factions against one another and no love or very little love. And yet, you can't build a structure with that. You know, when I was going through my marriage, it's hard to build a marriage when you're, you're at odds with one another. It's hard to endure and long suffer when you don't have that love for someone. But as we begin to grow, as we begin to find out where God has us, we need to first do it with the love of God. Uh, I want to start in chapter 2 of 1 John. And I'm just going to read a little bit as the Lord leads here. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write to you no new commandment. I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. No, no, we'll stop there. We have read in 1 Corinthians 13 about seeing face to face. Then we see this darkness because there's not there's hate going on. There's not love there. And there's blindness. Sometimes when we don't get the love of God to be at a certain level in our life, we can have blindness in things that causes us to have reactions and to, to see and understand things that aren't quite right. And in verse 12, it says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. We need to remember that when we're dealing with um, people who come in and, and they're just they're little children. They don't, know, they don't know better yet in some sense. And I want to remind us of what Jesus said on the cross. I always go back to this place. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. See, they're blinded. Because they're in the darkness. They do things in a blinded manner. God wants us to see. Not just one another in a new light, but also him in a new light. So in verse 13, he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Now I want to stop right there, overcoming the wicked one. We're talking about love. See, there's a point to where I was trying to get free from sin in my life. And I struggled. So when I got in the word of God, I began to grow and the love of God began to grow in me. 
I begin to overcome. Now we read in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 about the overcomer promises. And I believe this corresponds. I write to you now, man, because you have overcome the wicked one. There's a place to where we need to overcome so that we can enter into these overcomer promises. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. See, there's a strong abiding word. We've been talking about the word of God growing and prevailing. So there's an aspect that where we need to have the word of God abiding in us so that we can have the love of God abiding in us. I shared, uh, I think on Friday, about as we meditate on God's word, there's a process going on. We're getting the word into us, into our spirit, so that we can give it out. And so when I want to stop here for a second. It says the word of God abides in you. There's a process of we need to learn about what God says about love so that we can express it, so that we can know it. Um, again, I say, where's the scripture for that? When we begin to meditate on the love of God's scriptures, things that God talks about his love, we begin to grow in the love of God. Just like when we begin to eat other scriptures about different things like healing or um, being free from different things, as we begin to get in the word and it abides in us, we begin to grow in those things. So how do we get the love of God? There's two parts. One, we have to get the word of God on the matter. We need to know what his love is to us. We need to know what his love is to other people. And it's not just reading about it. See, there's a part of meditating on God's word that begins to bring you into experience because you begin to abide in that word. And then, so the first part is as the word of God begins to grow, you begin to experience more of the love of God as you meditate on the love scriptures. And so I'm going to take a, a second to talk about online. There's some free PDFs about the meditating in God's word. They have um, in it a section on love. If you want to grow in something, eat it. What I mean by that is eat on the good word. Keep it in your mouth day and night. When I needed some help in growing in love, I thought it was just a prayer aspect. Well, Lord, help me. Give me more love. I just need more love, God. I mean, obviously, look at my life. I am deficient of love. Now, it says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. But in this scripture, we find the word of God abides in you. There's a part where the love of God has to abide in us. The word of God has to abide in us before we can experience the things that we are asking God for. I always go back to the word, always go back to the scriptures. Every little thing I want to know, but not very many people are teaching on the love of God in the sense that how do you experience this great love? And my question is, do you know what the Bible says about God's love? What does the scripture say? And to be completely honest, I really only knew one for so long. John 3.16 but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's all I knew about the love of God. God loved me so much. He gave me the Lord so that I didn't have to perish, but I could have this eternal life. But do you know there's more aspects to the love of God than just that? If you're curious about this love, I encourage you to start getting in the scriptures and finding out how much he loves us. And when I talked about on my one of my first uh, prayer times on Thursday or Friday night, I want to, I want you to see about this love because this love transformed my life once I read this scripture. We're going to turn to John chapter 17. Jesus is praying here. And we're going to turn to verse 23. And uh, my son is running out of the um, the back. We're working on all the different things. So love the children. It's okay. God loved the little children. He says, don't turn them away from me. So we have another example. <laughs> um, 
I love kids. Love seeing the kids. And if you're watching online, my son just ran out to the service from the back room. So, um, but <laughs> um, you know, the innocent little children. Jesus would lay his hands on them and pray for them. He said, "Don't, don't turn them away from me." And in the same way. Um, I grew up in a big family. This is just a little aside before we go to this scripture. I grew up in a big family, and um, you have a lot of opportunities to learn about love when you see a lot of children together. Sometimes they can be so loving that you're like, whoa, wh where did you learn that from? And at the same time, in almost a minute, you're like, why are you acting so horrible? <laughs> You were just over here, and, and now you're over here doing something mean, taking a toy or something, uh, whatever it may be. But we see this model of going back and forth so quickly with children. And a lot of times we've experienced that church. Well, we love you as long as you come in, you do everything right, pay your tithes, keep in order. But, you know, God has turned us back to a greater standard. We're going to love you. We're going to endure with you. We're going to suffer along with you until you get to where God has you. Because you know what? God's got a great treasure in you. He's got a great call on your life. Because one day there's someone out there that is waiting for you to tell them about Jesus. I believe that. That God has prepared good works for us. So I'm not going to quit on you. We're not going to quit on you in this ministry. We believe in you. And whether God calls you to be here for a time and go out, that's fine. See, we're a part of a body. And God is opening up, you know, part of the vision of this ministry is there's 10,000 churches worldwide. You might be here for a moment, and then the Lord said, hey, I called you out. You're going to go to South Africa. You might go to Mexico or China. He might call you somewhere. That's okay. But the time we have together... I'm going to put everything that I possibly can impart to you to do the work of the ministry for edifying of the body of Christ so that when you get there, you're ready. So that you get there, you have known God. See, part of boldness is I know in whom I trust. See, I know God will not leave me or forsake me because I've been there. I have been in places where mentally it was the deepest darkness place for me. I don't think I've ever been any lower, and Jesus met me there. He showed me his great love. He began to teach me about this great love, the love that never fails. See, we're going to go through persecutions at different times and different points in our lives when we come to speak about Jesus Christ, but yet our love needs to be greater than their hate. Our love needs to be so overpowering that when they come to hate us, persecute us, do wrong to us, spit on us, beat us, maybe even at times kill our friends who are sharing the gospel, that we will love them greater than that hate. Because love never fails. You know, I come to you because, and I'm, this is where I'm going to read this scripture, because Jesus wants us to know how much the Father loves us. It says in verse 23, I in them and you and me that you may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I read that scripture day in, day out, night and day because I wanted to know really what this meant. It's so profound that it will change everything in your life when you get it. And if you can see it, it's yours. See, Jesus wants us to know that the Father loves us just as much. The same measure, the same capacity, the same passion, the same fervency, the same breakthrough as he did Jesus. And it helped me with everything else I began to read in the scripture. When I had trouble wondering, is he willing to heal me? I come back to this verse. The father loved me as he loved Jesus. 
Is he willing? Well, if he loves me like Jesus, of course. He is. We can go and go through the scriptures on prosperity and, and, and things for my needs. Will God provide for me today? What if I give my tithes and I don't have enough money for food, but I believe I want to honor God and obey? Will he provide? Well, yeah, he did. See, that's an experience I've had, a testimony I can give. I chose to because I loved him so much. That even if I had to go without food for the whole month, just so my, you know, we would have just enough for maybe my kids to have some beans and rice, which I love beans and rice. So I'm, that's all we could afford, though. Uh, I don't want to be hating on beans and rice because I love beans and rice, but that's all I could afford. But I was like, if there's not enough for them, so that for them to have for the rest of the month and I don't have to eat, well, then that's what I'm going to do because I want to honor God. Because I know that he loves me. And that even if I have to go through a few meals, what is that to the one who I love? I'm willing to suffer for that love. So when I began to see this, how much he loved me, then I could go out through the scriptures. And as I begin to read all these books, all these scriptures, all these precious promises about the love that comes through this filter, that God loves me this much. It was easy to believe. Faith works by love. And in the Greek, it's that, the word energes, and it's that faith is energized by love. My faith began to be energized. My life began to change because I had the love of God. When we were building this structure and we're preparing for what God is about to do, I believe he's going to give us a deposit of his love. So as we're preparing, love is not something that um, necessarily we experience all of it at one time. It's something that grows. It's a process. Love is patient. Love is kind. When we begin to grow, not just in knowing God's love, in our own love, there's an action that goes with it. But I started out or I kind of went back to this foundation because as I was preaching last week um, about the hope of our calling and finding out where we belong and what ministry we have and all those different things, um, I felt compelled as I was getting ready today to not go into that so much yet. Because if we don't build a foundation on the love of God, we're going to crumble. Now, I want to read actually in uh, Revelation chapter 2, because I had talked about this earlier, about the Ephesian church. Because uh, as you can tell, one of the prophecies that have been given over this church is that we're considered Ephesus 2, or we're the second church that's going to, you know, exude this, uh, the Ephesus church and, and look like that. But when I was looking at it, I didn't want us to have, um, I didn't want us to have, hey, big boy, hey, come on, I'm sorry, uh, man, being tested on the love of God as we're speaking, <laughs> um, and that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna grow. I'm sure that's not gonna be the only child that's gonna be running through here. But you know what? God's not offended. The Spirit of God can still move and work. It's gonna take a lot more to stop the love of God than someone running through. But uh, I want to read this because I don't want us to be here. And since we've learned that we're going to be like the church of Ephesus. We're going to see unusual miracles. We're going to see the power of God. I want to read this so we don't do these things. It says, uh, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered 
and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Now I want to stop real quick before I read this next part. They were doing some mighty works in Ephesus. You read about that. I mean, I'm, wow. Miracles, people coming to know God, preaching for two years that all of Asia and these places, everyone have heard, has heard about the gospel of God. That's pretty astounding. But then he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly, remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop here real quick. What are the works that they did at first? You ever wonder that? What are the first works? What were they doing at first and how were they doing it? Well, we find out through the scripture here, they lost their first love. When you go through the motions, you're doing different things because you may be get sidetracked by the miracles. You might get sidetracked by the masses. We can get sidetracked. Things can move us out. There's prosperity coming. There's all these different things, blessings. But they lost their first love. Now, I want to give this example. We've seen it many times. We've actually been there many times, I believe. When you first came to know Jesus, how were you? Now, we all have different stories, and some of us might be more progressive and loving God than others. But when you get around a newborn, converted believer, man, they are a sponge. They love God so much. They're willing to do so many different things. Oh, God, you know, yeah, you're going to pray all night? Sure, you know, you know, all these different things. The love of God is just, they love God. They're excited about the things of God. They're excited to encounter God. But sometimes when you're doing the work, experiencing all these different things, our love can grow cold because we begin to lose some of that passion and desire for God. Even though we see so great mighty works, And then verse 6, it says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And uh, there's a lot of different teachings on this. The one I believe, you know, I agree with a lot of them. There's a lot of different ones about what are the Nicolaitans. But one of the things that I've learned about um, is, you know, the Nicolaitans represent these people um, who basically wanted to do their own thing without any kind of leadership. Um, there's a lot of different stuff, but that's the one that I know of as far as a definition of what the Nicolaitans were. Um, kind of like Korah in when Moses' time. Well, we're prophets too. You know, we uh, we could prophesy too. We can do all these things too. Um, but the Lord has an order. He has a authority structure. He has the fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints for a reason. So they could do the work of the ministry. There's so many different things. Um, but they had these deeds going on that the Lord wasn't happy with. I don't want to stay there too long. And then verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Wow, to eat of the tree of life. See, Adam and Eve, they had the tree of life. We find that Christ is the tree of life. But we get to eat of it in the midst of the paradise of God, it says, as an overcomer. Now, I like to give this explanation as, uh, you know, there's ability and access to enter into heavenly places and actually eat of the fruit of the tree of life, even now, while we're here on the earth. But we can, we can ascend up and we can go into heavenly places and God gives us different things to eat. See, as a model in the, in the Old Testament and even in the book of Revelation where they're eating things. But we get to have more impartations of the tree of life in our life. But I read this for this one reason. 
this is something as a pastor here that I want to always keep in the forefront. First love. If we can just keep first love, we can keep everything else in order. If we can keep first love with God and then the right love for each other, no matter what we're going through as a group, no matter how things are going, no matter how many people are coming, we'll be able to build a structure that's knit tightly, jointed together, strong, so that people begin to see the model that Christ has for his church, one that's filled with love for one another. If you're hungry, we'll feed you. If you're in prison, we'll come and visit you. If you're thirsty, we'll give you something to drink. If you're hurting, we'll pray for you. We'll stand in faith with you till we see what God says is the truth on the matter. If you're sick, we'll pray for you. We'll keep praying till we see the breakthrough. I know we're all growing because the signs and wonders, their miracles are happening. But as we step in, take a step of faith and we grow, we're not going to just lax off and be like, well, man, it's kind of embarrassing. I pray for you again and got, no, I didn't see the manifestation or those different things. No, we're not going to quit there. When it comes to love, when it comes to the things of God, if we don't have love, it will profit us nothing. I want to pray. We're going to close here. I want to pray um, for the love of God to be released among us, that, that we encounter this love in a great measure. But also before I do that, I want to encourage you to start getting in scriptures and finding different things on the love of God. If uh, you don't have very much time to find them yet, you know, there's resources available for you to find that. And that's in that meditation book, Johan Ministries. You can go look in the section two, you find there's the love of God scriptures. Um, and so I started there. And then God began to grow this love into my heart. God will do the same for you. He will. I, prom I promise because it's his promise. See, I can say in such 100% clarity and boldness to know that God's word always works. No matter who applies it, no matter where you might be, you apply the word of God and it will work every time. Just don't quit. Just don't quit. And I'm going to help encourage you not to quit. I'll be here with you. And those online who, who come and as God begins to grow this thing, we're going to do this together. I'm going to stand with you before God. I'm going to pray. Just like I've been reading these scriptures about night and day are prayers for you. I'm going to do that. And I believe that that's going to begin to create a a really a lifestyle in this church, a DNA of praying for one another and sharing the love of God. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pray now. Father God, we thank you for your word. I thank you for everyone here and everyone that's watching online. Oh, Father, give them revelation, Lord, that you love them as much as you love Jesus. You love us as much as you love Jesus. No matter where we're at, no matter what we have done or failed to do, you love us. We're your treasure. You're looking to grow us and bring us closer to you. So, Father, I thank you right now that by faith you're releasing a greater measure of love and, and passion and desire for you. I pray that your love, Lord God, this love that never fails, be released into this church in this time, in this hour. It begins to work on their hearts and break down anything that might cause a hindrance between you and them. Father, I also pray that you grow the love of God in our hearts once we experience that for our brother. That we would love our brother and our sisters. And that we would travail in prayer for them and that we would be long-suffering 
as we begin to discover where we're placed and as we begin to grow more and more in you, that we have patience with one another and kindness and gentleness and goodness and all the fruits of the Spirit would manifest here. Father, I thank you for answering our prayer. I thank you that even now that you've heard me, that you've heard us as we come together in agreement, that you're doing a wonderful work in this hour, this time in our lives, equipping us, preparing us for this great outpouring that's coming in July. I thank you, I praise you, I give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and close online. Um, if anyone has needs prayer or anything, uh, I'm here to pray for you. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and close this right now. So we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye.